All right, so this video is uh, dealing with the formal definition of a limit. And uh, we're only going to work with uh, very, very basic functions for the formal definition of a limit. The version that you learned last year is actually uh, very informal. And um, so, so we'll do an example. Uh, this entire four-page handout is one example and then one extra problem. Um, but the idea is that it, it, it's a complicated looking definition and, uh, and it's one that I feel like students struggle with a ton in calculus. Um, it's the sort of thing where you get it for a day and then you lose it and then you see it again later on and it makes some sense. So this is one that I highly recommend you bring this handout with you to college. And when you come across it, you pull it out if it doesn't make sense. So. Uh, we're going to look at a very basic function here. It's basically a linear function with a hole in it. Um, if you were to graph this function f of x right here, I'm just going to graph it on the side. Uh, let's see, 2x minus 1, except at 3, looks like kind of like this. There's 3. And, um, and when x equals 3, we get 10. And let's see, 2x minus 1, around 3 would be about 5. So this hole is at 5 and uh, instead it's filled in up here at 10. So this is the function f of x that we've graphed. Um, so we know that if this is the function we're dealing with, the 2x minus 1 and 10, depending on what values we have for x, if we know that when x gets really, really close to 3, but never actually, we don't actually care what happens at 3, so we're looking around 3, Right, right around here and here, we know that the y value gets really, really close to 5. Uh, and so that's why we're allowed to write that kind of notation there. Limit as x goes to 3 of f of x equals 5. The problem is that the way that you learned that was you used phrases like gets really, really close to. So that's vague. <laughs> and so um, no matter how you describe gets really, really close to, a mathematician, a pure mathematician, isn't going to like that. There needs to be a way to formally define that. So um, we're going to do some groundwork before we do the formal definition. So let's say that gets close to mean that f of x gets close to 5 means the same thing as f of x and 5 are less than 0.1 units apart. Right? So the distance between f of x and 5 is less than 0.1. Now remember, a way to write the distance between a and b, well, if a is bigger than b, then it's a minus b. If b is bigger than a, then it's b minus a. But if you don't know which one's bigger, you can just write the absolute value of a minus b or the absolute value of b minus a. Right? That's the distance. Um, so if I'm saying that the distance between f of x and 5 is less than 0.1, then that's writing this. Okay, so the idea is that f of x is pretty close to point is pretty close to 5. It's 0.1 units away from 0.5. It's less than 0.1 units away. Um, but the idea is that that means that x has to be pretty close to 3. So we should figure out how close to 3, how close do the x values have to be to 3 in order to be within 0.1 of 5. So between 4.9 and 5.1, what are the x values I need to go with that? Right. Now, uh, that's where this part comes in. How close do I have to be to 3? What, what is x, how close does x have to be to 3 for the y to be... 0.1 unit, less than 0.1 units away from 5. So close to 5. Okay, now remember with a limit, you don't actually care what happens at the x value. So the way to say that I don't care what happens at 3, right, is that the distance between the x that I'm picking and 3 uh, is never 0. It's always bigger than 0. So there's this... Uh, the idea is that I'm trying to find a distance away from 3 that I need to be in order to have the y value 
be 0.1 unit, less than 0.1 units away from 5. Okay. So that's 0 here. This thing tells me I don't care what happens when x is 3. I just care what happens when x is close to 3. Okay. So, um, the symbol that gets used to define how far apart the x should be from the value you're looking at around, so as x approaches 3, that, that symbol is always going to be delta. Uh, so, we'll replace that question mark with a delta, and we get this line right here. Okay, so if I define close, f of x gets close to 5 as x gets close to 3. Whoops, sorry about that f of x gets close to 5 means within point 0.1. Okay. Now, again, remember, the if part is here. So if x is getting close to 3, it's approaching 3, it's pretty small distance from 3, then f of x should be pretty close to 5, within point 0.1 of 5. So the question is, how do I find that value? Okay. How do I find the delta? So let's play with this side. So we're going to start with f of x minus 5 is less than 0.1, 0 0.1. Okay, so that means we know that f of x is going to be now close to point, close to, uh, let's see, since I'm looking around 3 for x, uh, but not at 3, I'm going to use this function here, that version, that part of the function. So that's 2x minus 1 has to be less than 0 0.1. Uh, and that'll turn into 2x minus 6 in absolute values has to be less than 0 0.1. Uh, I could factor out a 2. And then I could divide by 2. Oh, whoops. x minus 3, absolute value is less than 0 0.1 over 2, which is the same thing as 0 0.05. So, is 0 is less than x minus 3. Oh, by the way, the reason that this is useful, sorry, I should point this out. The reason that this is good is because it takes this form right over here. Right? x minus 3 is going to be the distance between x and 3 should be less than 0 0.05. So, um, yeah, let's see. Now remember, I don't care what happens when x equals 3. So, if I have this, less than 0 0.05, then I know f of x minus 5 is going to be less than 0 0.1. Okay, now I have to have that 0 part in there because if x equaled 3, then I don't actually get that the distance between the y and 5 is 0 0.1. Remember, you got to include the fact, because here, right, x equals 3, that yields 10. So you got to include the fact that x doesn't have to ever actually equal 3 by including that part. Okay, so uh, let me wrap this up here. So delta being 0 0.05, um, delta if, so delta equals that if f of x gets close to 5 means they're less than 0.1 units apart, or away, away from each other. Okay? So, we figured out how close I have to be to x in order to have f of x get pretty close to the 5 that I thought it should equal. So, okay, what if 0.1 isn't close enough? What if I wanted it to be point? Oh, one units apart instead, right? Then I'd have to shrink down. 
how close I am to x. Right now, I figured out if I'm within 0 0.05 on either side of 3, then I get within 0.1 on either side of the 5. But what if I didn't want uh, just 0.1 units away from 5? I wanted 0.01 units away from 5. Then I'd have to get closer to 3. Right? So, uh, if you wanted to work it out, if you said I wanted f of x and 5 to be within 0.01 units apart, 0 0.01 units apart, then that only happens, and you can work out this same kind of process again, but the only thing that changes is that delta. That happens if x minus 3, the distance between x and 3 has to be less than 0 0.005. It's still got to be bigger than 0 because I don't want x to ever equal 3. Uh, so this means delta would be 0 0.005. Okay, what if we want to name for the y value to n5 to be less than 0 0.001 units apart? Well, then the only thing that's going to change again is the delta, and you can work out the whole thing if you wanted. Oops, x minus 3 is less than, it turns out to just have an extra 0 in there. So delta would be 0 0.0005. Okay. So, um, so we've gotten a little more formal with defining gets close to, right? As x gets close to 3, which means as x is within 0 0.0005 units of 3, but never actually equaling 3 then the y value is within 0 0.001 units of 5. Okay, that's the way to read this. Well, <laughs> that's still saying as x gets close, that's still saying as x gets this close, then y gets that close. Right? So that's still kind of vague for gets close to, because the real idea is gets infinitely close to, arbitrarily close to. So, uh, the idea is that we should be able to pick any value, any positive value, for how close we want f of x and 5 to be. Okay, and then the phrase for that is arbitrarily close. I wrote ridiculously close, but arbitrarily close means as close as you really want. Um, so what if we wanted to have those be arbitrarily close, those, those f of x and 5? So if we wanted... f of x minus 5, that distance between them, to be any positive number. Okay. We can show this happens uh, if x and 3 aren't equal to each other, but are within something related to this positive number. Okay, now if you look above, it turned out whatever value I picked for how close I wanted those y values to be to each other, I wanted the y value to be within 0 0.01 of 5 or 0 0.001 of 5 or 0 0.1 of 5. It turned out each time, if you divide by 2, you get how close those x values should be together. Okay, so it turns out that this would be that positive number divided by 2 in this case. Right? Now, the real way you want to write this, uh, we want to call the any positive number epsilon, this Greek curvy capital E. Um, so, oops, we can say f of x minus 5 is less than epsilon if 0 is less than the distance between x and 3 is less than epsilon over 2. So the delta is epsilon over 2. Okay, so let's talk about the graphical way of thinking about this. So there's our function, that's f of x. Notice the, the hole there and then the dots filled in up at 10. Okay, so the way to read the sentence that we just wrote in blue here 
Um, the if part is what we're looking at first. So uh, we've got this interval around three, this x interval around three, and it goes delta units to the right and delta units to the left. Uh, x and three are going to be within delta units of each other. So this to here, right? This is a delta. That's a delta. So this this part right here is three plus delta, and this part right here is three minus delta. Okay. Now if I trace them up and over, right. Then what should happen is I should be guaranteed that f of x is going to fall into a certain epsilon range. So this ends up being, in this case, this ends up being 5 plus epsilon and 5 minus epsilon. And this works out nicely because it's linear. If it's curved, it's a little bit harder to work out. Um, so here, I'll do this. Use, actually, I'll switch colors here so this shows up a little better. So this one's 5 plus epsilon, 5 minus epsilon. There's my interval that I'm looking at. Um, so here, I'll kind of put steps. The first step is to really look at the deltas first. So if x is in this interval, except the x that equals 3, then f of x will be in this interval. Notice as the deltas get smaller, the epsilons will have to get smaller too. Or as the epsilons get smaller, the deltas have to get smaller, either way. Now in this case, we knew that the deltas would end up being epsilon over two. Okay. All right, so putting it all together, okay. <laughs> This little phrase that you've used a ton means for any epsilon you pick that's bigger than zero, because it represents a distance, so any epsilon you pick, you can find a delta where if x and 3 are within delta units of each other, but x doesn't equal 3, then f of x and 5 are within epsilon units of each other. Okay. So this is saying, as x gets close to 3 but never equals 3, then f of x gets close to 5. And the idea is that it gets as close as you could possibly want it to be to 5, any positive distance away from 5. Okay? All right. So here's the mathy way of writing these things. So in math talk, this means the same thing as for every epsilon greater than zero, you can find a delta greater than zero. There exists a delta greater than zero such that if that distance between x and three is bigger than zero and less than delta, then f of x minus five is going to be less than that any positive number you wanted, that distance between f of x and five. Okay, now to formally do this, um, don't worry about infinity, infinite limits here. Um, if we say as x goes to a, f of x turns into l, uh, or approaches l, then you can say for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that if zero is less than x minus a is less than delta, absolute values, right? Then the difference between f of x and l is going to be epsilon, less than epsilon. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this next part. Okay, so in the next part, we're looking at a function that's not as clean. It's some curved function. That's the blue function. And the idea is that we're looking around the point x equals a, or the value when x equals a. And you know that the limit is going to be capital L here. Okay, so the goal is, the idea of a limit is that you know that if you pick any epsilon you want and look at this range around epsilon, 
you should be able to make epsilon as small as you want, you're supposed to be able to find a delta that goes along the x, a delta distance between a and something, that's the delta. Um, you should be able to find that delta so that this is true, right? So the way to figure this out graphically is to draw in, you know, figure out your L, go up epsilon and down epsilon, trace over and figure out, okay, I've got these X values that correspond to my lower bound and upper bound for L, okay? So the real question though is, which one of these am I supposed to pick to represent delta? Do I pick the smaller one or the bigger one? So which to pick? delta. Okay, well we want to pick the value so that any x value within delta units of a will give us an, x, an f of x value within epsilon units of l. So what if we pick the larger value, the larger difference, right? So that would be this one here, right? So if we pick this one to be delta, then I've got this going on. This length would be delta. And if I extended it to the other side, that length would be delta. Notice it, has, it goes beyond this vertical green line because delta, I picked a bigger interval. So then if I trace up and over, okay, I got that upper bound. If I trace up and over here, Um, below the lower bound. So if I kind of think about what all these values turn into and then trace them over, I fill in everything that I wanted except some extra stuff, right? I've gone below down here, right? So there's that extra stuff down there that's a problem. So I'm going to write here. Oh no. <laughs> F of x is not necessarily within epsilon units of L if we pick the larger of the two distances to be delta. By the larger of the two distances, I'm talking about this one and this one. Okay, so let's try the smaller one. So if we pick the smaller one to be delta, this region right here is delta. So then the other region would fall within those green lines, right? The other one would also be delta. And if I trace up and over, and I think about everything that falls into this region, and then see what that comes out. It comes out to everything in this range, which actually is within the epsilon range, right? So um, if we pick the smaller option for delta, uh, then we found A delta greater than zero such that whoop, such that if x and a aren't equal to each other but are within delta units of each other then f of x minus l have to be within or f of x and l have to be within epsilon units of each other Okay. Now, the key here is that epsilon can be any value, right? Epsilon can be extraordinarily small. And if you made epsilon really, really small, well, you'd still get these two intervals down here. You just choose the smaller of them, and you're guaranteed to fall into that epsilon range if those x values are within that delta range. Okay? So epsilon can be any positive value. The key is that Whatever value you pick, whatever positive epsilon you pick, you're able to find a delta that goes with it for those x values. Okay?
All right, so let's kind of put it together here and try a problem. Now, you're still going to use the methods that you've learned last year in calculus to get what the limits actually are. Nobody really does limits this way. Um, the question that's different is prove that the limit equals some specific value. So using so the way that these problems show up, using the formal definition of a limit, prove that the limit as x goes to 1 of that linear function, 2 plus 4x over 3 equals 2. Now, <laughs> you know you can just substitute 1 into that and get 2 as your answer. Um, but if you wanted to prove it formally, you got to use the epsilon and delta definition. So here's the first part. We want to show that the limit as x goes to 1 of 2 plus 4x over 3 equals 2. Now I'm going to call this, on the side here I'm going to say f of x equals 2 plus 4x over 3. Let that be. Okay? Now the definition... The formal definition of a limit is this one up here, right there. Okay, so in fact, I'll cut and paste that. Here we go. All right, edit, copy. Let's move that down here. I'm just going to paste it right on the side here somewhere. Whoop. Paste. Let's move that over so we have it on the screen. Whoop. Oh, great. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. I'll uh, put that. <laughs> this is not working well for me. Let's just put that here for right now. Okay, so if I use that definition to rewrite the way that we've written it here, then the definition becomes for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if zero is less than x minus, now a in this case is one, is less than delta, then f of x minus 2, because that's the limit, is less than epsilon. All right. So the pre-proof work. Let me get rid of this now. Okay. okay. So remember before when we were doing it informally, where is that? We started out with the epsilon part and worked it out until we got something that kind of looked like the delta part. So let's do that. We're going to start with the epsilon part. So start with f of x minus 2 is less than epsilon. So if we do that, we, we can substitute the f of x part. That was 2 plus 4x over 3 minus 2 has to be less than epsilon. And then if we manipulate that a little bit, let's see, that's 2 thirds plus 4x over 3 plus, or minus 6 over 3 is less than epsilon. So that'll be 4x, 4 thirds x minus 4 thirds is less than epsilon. I could factor out the 4 thirds and get x minus 1 less than epsilon. Now, that's starting to look like the delta part over here. And in fact, if I multiply both sides by 3 fourths, so x, if x minus 1 is less than 3 fourths epsilon, um, now it looks an awful lot like this. What it actually does is it suggests what we should pick for delta. Okay, based on this, we need to find a delta that works for any epsilon greater than zero we pick. 
and the delta could be based on epsilon. Well, that's actually what we ended up with down here. We got something that looks a lot like that delta form that we want. So this here, this suggests that we pick uh, delta equals 3 fourths, whoops, <laughs> 3 fourths epsilon. OK, so that's not the proof. The proof comes next. And it's almost like working it backwards, working, working the whole thing backwards. So <clears throat> remember, we want, we want this to work for any epsilon greater than 0, for every epsilon greater than 0, any one that I pick, right? So we're going to start out with this. Really, the goal is to show that delta equals 3 over 4 epsilon works in that definition. So we're going to start out by saying, given any epsilon greater than 0, we're going to choose delta to equal 3 fourths epsilon. OK, this means this is the for any epsilon greater than 0, we have a delta greater than 0. Okay, that's that part of the thing. Well, okay, so we've got the first part, right? For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero. We know that the delta is greater than zero because it's three fourths of epsilon, which is positive. So then I need to say if that if I have that, then if this is true, then that has to be true. So now I'm going to do the delta part. So if zero is less than the distance between x minus 1 and delta is less than delta, then the f of x minus 2 turns into the 2 plus 4x over 3 minus 2, which turns into 4 thirds x minus 1. Now, <clears throat> I did I did a little work and quickly there, but you could work it out backwards from the previous thing. Well, I know that x minus one has to be bigger than the difference between x and one has to be bigger than or it's smaller than delta. So this thing has to be smaller than four thirds of delta. Well, that's equal to four thirds of three fourths of epsilon, which equals epsilon. So this then part turns into f of x minus 2 is less than epsilon, right? This equal this equal that, and then here's the less than. So any term, any one thing on this side is less than any one version on that side. So um, I'll include the first part again. If 0 is less than x minus 1 is less than delta, then that. Okay, so thus, if 0 is less than x minus 1 is less than delta, then 2, whoops, 2 plus 4x over 3 minus 2 must be less than epsilon when delta equals 3 fourths epsilon. Therefore, by the definition of a limit, We have that the limit as x goes to 1 of 2 plus 4x over 3 equals 2. And why can I do that final statement? Because we know that that's the formal definition. And if we have that, it leads me to that. All right. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Read it over a couple of times. Try to let it soak in a bit, especially the part uh, at the beginning that's a little more conceptual. Um, I'm not going to give you anything beyond linear 2D calculus stuff. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about how this works in multivariable. Um, but uh, I'm not going to test you beyond anything that's that's very basic linear functions. So.
Okay, I hope that helps a bit, and I'll see you guys soon.